everybody. I'm here live with you this afternoon uh, for just a QA. Um, I am looking forward to getting your questions. And as always, if you give me just a moment, I'm going to get on so I can see the feed as I'm doing this and see the, your questions. Um, please pop in and say hello. Tell me where you're from. If you want to start typing in questions, a lot of times as I get towards the end, then all of a sudden we get a ton of questions. So if you're here early and joining me now live, please ask me your questions about mold, about the gut, about Crohn's or colitis, about environmental toxicity, about anything you want to ask about health related questions. I am here for the next 20, 30 minutes live to answer your questions. And it's one of my favorite things to do. Always, always enjoy being here with you. Um, like I said, if you give me just a moment, I'm going to actually get this screen all up so that I can uh, see your questions and see what's going on in the feed here. So bear with me as I pull that up and uh, please say hello. Tell me where you're from. Um, and of course, I will dive into a topic if I don't get any questions right away. Always have something to talk about but I would love to be practical and answer your questions. So um, please type those in. If you haven't seen, we just got done uh, with an interview with uh, Dr. Shilpa Saxena, one of my, um, one beautiful colleague who does group visits. We talked about feminine energy and healing and how important it is to trust your intuition. Um, hey, Rue. Hey, Kathy. Um, awesome to see you guys here. Uh, please say hello. Tell me where you're from. And then uh, feel free to drop in your questions. But if you missed my interview just a few moments ago, it is available um, for replay here. And of course, just a little housekeeping, you can find all of my live Q&As. I think I've got seven or eight of them, and I've got almost 80 interviews with other docs um, on my YouTube channel. So just search Dr. Jill Carnahan. You'll see my YouTube channel there. And please subscribe. You'll get notifications when I put up new interviews. And I just do this for fun. I, I enjoy doing it and uh, lots and lots of great free content with experts. Um, you've heard me say this before, but I always learn from the people that I interview. So it's so much fun to be here with you and to talk to um, amazing colleagues and, and uh, other people. And stay tuned because we've got some great guests coming up. Dr. Richard Horowitz is coming back and many more. So if you watch my Facebook feed, you'll see upcoming announcements of the Facebook Live and interviews and who's going to be there and what time it's playing. And you can always replay them. Um, if you missed any, you can find them all on YouTube. And now I'm live on iTunes. Uh, podcast is fully functional there, Dr. Jill Live. And you can see um, interviews or just listen to them if you are running or in the car. It's a little easier to use. And that's on Stitcher, on iTunes, anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can find those. So um, please join me. Uh, I would love if you like the show to leave a review because that helps us uh, get more uh, listeners on that. Um, hey, it sounds like everybody's coming. Hi, Liz. Um, uh, hi, Tyler. Hello, Ashok. Uh, hello, Monica. So I'm going to start answering some questions from you guys. Um, first thing, thoughts on NAD suppositories, Liz. Let's get right to the, the topics. Okay, NAD, nicotinamide riboside. NAD is a precursor of ATP and really, really powerful in healing the body. It contributes to uh, ability to make this cellular currency we call ATP. It uh, contributes to ability to repair and detoxify. And a lot of us, uh, for example, if we're in mold or moldy environment, we may actually have deficiencies in the precursors of NAD. So taking NAD is important and um, maybe very helpful. Now there is a time and a place because just like B vitamins, which upregulate methylation for detoxification, sometimes if you're really toxic and you upregulate these wonderful processes, you actually are detoxifying faster than your body can eliminate those toxins and you run into a wall or you get sick. So do be careful with these things. They're very powerful. If you're not feeling well, when you take them, you probably want to go slower, back off, decrease the dose. So NAD back to dosing suppositories. NAD can be given liposomally. This is under your tongue. NAD can be given subcutaneously in injection. It can be given intravenously in an IV. It could be given in a suppository. It can be given in a spray. So basically any way that the body doesn't break it down, usually oral caps, there's a few forms that are uh, made so that the uh, stomach acid doesn't destroy it. But all of these other forms are so that you bypass the stomach acid in the gut and you can get it directly in the bloodstream through IV. You can get it in your tissues through subcutaneous and 
Um, suppositories, you get rectal absorption of NAD, um, any sort of drug that you would use that way, it, because there's such a great blood flow, you get very increased absorption. But I would say, while it is an option, I don't feel like it's any better than the other options. My preference is oral, liposomal, or intranasally. Um, although IV and subcutaneous are fine as well, I feel like the other routes are easier. You don't have to go to a special location to get them, and um, they can be just as good as uptake. So they're all um, uh, legitimate routes that you can use to increase your NAD. Okay, hi Tyler, um, carboxy binder from Cellcor, thoughts on um, mold. So uh, binders are so critical in the mold detox process. And um, you mentioned one in particular, there are uh, probably, you know, dozens of binders now out there. I still like the basics like clay and charcoal. I find often they work the best, but some of our patients are so toxic that you do one of those binders and it's just too much. The one you mentioned, Biotox binder, I'll be sure and include a link to that. Um, it is fairly, fairly gentle. It's made with humic and fulvic acids, which are very gentle. Um, they are typically good as an antiviral as well. And typically people are really sensitive may not react as strongly to those. I also find it's not as strong of a binder. So it's kind of the trade-off. If you're really sensitive, it's a great way to start. Um, I still love, like I said, clay, charcoal, glycomannins, uh, chlorella, um, humic fulvic acids. Um, there's so many things out there that are good binders and you can combine them because each of them has slightly different charges and those different charges will give you different access to pulling out the toxins in your body. So I, I'm a big fan of combining different binders. Hey, Ashak from Houston. Uh, thank you for uh, saying hello and joining us here. Hey, Monica from Florida, um, binders, inflammation. Oh, so you're talking about what I just described. So, okay, this is so interesting. I have an interview that we just did last week with Beth O'Hara on mast cell activation and mold. Um, be sure and go back either here or YouTube, iTunes and find that interview um, because you'll really enjoy hearing that. We describe the process by which when you're basically... I'll, I'll put it in basic terms. So when you're detoxifying, we're mobilizing toxins and excreting them out of the body. And both parts are important because if you mobilize too quickly and you get that toxic load into your bloodstream where the body can filter it through the kidneys or the lungs or the skin or the liver, um, but you push too hard, like maybe you take too many binders or too high of a dose, even glutathione, which is a good thing. You might've heard me say my first two years of mold detox, I could not tolerate glutathione. And we hear that term, we hear about it, and you may be discouraged or disappointed if you get worse when you take it. That just means you're mobilizing those toxins too quickly for your body to excrete them. So the process uh, of what you need to do is to decrease the mobilization rate. You can decrease dose or frequency, et cetera, or use a more gentle approach. You could use precursors of glutathione instead of glutathione itself. NAC, glycine, glutamine, selenium, lipoic acid, all of those things are helpful, milk thistle. And some of those can be just as good in a slow, steady dose. Even vitamin C uh, can be helpful um, in making your, helping your body to make more glutathione. But the real problem here is you're not able to excrete as fast as you're mobilizing. And if that's happening, then waste enhanced excretion would be infrared sauna. I love my PEMF mat. You've heard me talk about that. Um, Epsom salt baths, castor oil packs, coffee enemas, uh, drainage remedies from homeopathic companies like Pacana. So all of these things will help your body to mobilize toxins, even lymphatic mas massage or dry brushing. All of these things can be really powerful. And if you're like me, you're like, oh, I hate this mold. I want to get well. I want to do it. Um, but sometimes you push too hard and you get more sick. And I think Monica, that's one of the things you're describing there. Um, and it is frustrating. You just have to go more slowly at the rate that your body will allow. You'll get to the same end, but you don't want to push too hard or you get more sick and more toxic. Thank you, Liz, for your comment. Um, hi, Zohara. Uh, hello, Ashkak again, any precautions when giving N-acetylcysteine? So this is a great question, Ashak. Um, N-acetylcysteine is a sulfur-based precursor of N, uh, glutathione, really powerful. It's great for the lungs. It's a mucolytic. So if you have a uh, junk in your lungs or you have a chronic cough or some issues there, often it will break up the mucus in the biofilms. That's because it's a biofilm disruptor. So it's a powerful agent. I love um, NAC. Some people who have sulfur issues with sulfur past pathways, they won't tolerate an acetylcysteine. And if you have a very high fungal burden, I find patients don't often tolerate it, especially in high doses until they treat that fungal burden. Even so it's a powerful agent. And what you could do is start with 500 or, or less 
a low dose and see how you do. Sometimes when patients are really toxic or brain inflammation or need a higher dose, we'll go as high as two or 3000 milligrams per day. But again, it's a, something to treat uh, cautiously and go slowly. Those are the main things with N-acetylcysteine. Um, hi, Tyler. Um, oh, I love that you're mentioning calcium deglucurate. So every single pathway with detox and mold involves the glucuronidation pathway. This is a part of phase two in the liver that's responsible for getting those intermediates out of the liver and into the bile and into the gut and stool and out the body. So calcium deglucurate can be one of the helpful things for the glucuronidation pathway. Another thing in that pathway is sulforaphanes, which come from broccoli sprouts. We have our own, I'll, I'll show you a link. It's called Brocco Boost Plus. I took the very best research out there on the products and this is what I found to be the best sulforaphane out there. I love this as a survivor of breast cancer. Um, sulforaphanes are also absolutely essential for detoxifying estrogens and estrogen issues. So anyone who's had a high risk for breast cancer or who's had breast cancer, I think should absolutely be taking sulforaphanes for sure. Um, I was going to see if I could find that for you now. So I can leave a link so it's practical. So that up real quick and we'll keep going with our questions um, as we go. So there we go. I'm going to put a link right here and wherever you're listening to this, we'll be sure and include a link um, there as well. So I'm going to stick that in. Okay. So back to questions, uh, calcium deglucurate, I will put that on there too. So you guys can know what I'm talking about. There's lots of different ways you can get calcium deglucurate and most of your products are going to be similar in quality. Um, I will send you a link for that as well, just in case you want to know exactly what that is. So look in the chat box for that. Okay, so back to questions. Hi, Karen, uh, Mold Detox, what is the best product if I'm taking blood thinners? So um, blood thinners, uh, so what you'd want to avoid is vitamin K1, of course, because that definitely interacts and usually they recommend avoiding um, I don't think you should avoid healthy vegetables like leafy greens. They have a lot of vitamin K, but what you need to do is be very consistent with the amount you consume. So you don't want to have a big, huge green smoothie one day and not the rest, because if you're on Coumadin or some of these other blood thinners, the very, the levels of your um, PT and INR and those numbers we use to track the blood thinning will vary too much for the doctor to get you the right dose. Um, so uh, what to do with mold detox with blood thinners? coagulation is the process of the blood clotting. And let's talk just a little bit about that. And hopefully in a roundabout way, I will answer your question, Karen. Um, people who have chronic Lyme disease, mold toxicity, or many of these illnesses can have an issue where the body produces slightly excess fibrin in the vascular system. And we know that if there's just the smallest amount, like one micron thick of extra fibrin in your blood because of an inflammatory response, you're gonna decrease oxygen perfusion to the tissues by about 500%. So it's a big deal. You might feel more tired, more brain fog, more exercise intolerance. And this, I find this hypercoagulability from Babesia, from Bartonella, from Lyme, or from mold to be a big deal for many people. Now that's the opposite of what you're talking about. You're talking about being on blood thinners, but these two things can both happen because there's something called von Willebrand's factor that can be um, artificially upregulated in someone who has mold exposure and they can have nosebleeds or excessive bleeding. So both sides of the coin can happen even in the same person. Um, this is complex and way more than I can cover adequately on this Q and a, but I will just bring your awareness to it because there are natural things that you can do to decrease that fibrin production. Um, this is really important because a lot of times many of the symptoms are related to that hypercoagulability and decreased oxygen perfusion to the tissues. So all that to say, if you have mold issues and you're on an anticoagulant or a blood thinner, um, you can still detox. You can still use glutathione and binders but you would want to be aware of um, your levels in the blood, like PTI and R, how your doctor's tracking that, and maybe do that more frequently so that if there is something in your protocol that's affecting the thinner thickness of your blood, you'd be able to, your doctor would be able to see that and you'd be able to back off. There is no inherent reason why you couldn't take a binder or glutathione, but again, work with your doctor on that. I'm not giving medical advice here and make sure that your blood stays in the adequate ranges. Uh, thank you, Monica, for your thanks. Uh, leg cramps, Christina, great question. Oh my gosh, this is so common, right? Any of you have who have had leg cramps, miserable, right? Oh, 
gosh, I've had them before and they can wake you out of a dead sleep and almost screaming in pain. Um, typically the number one thing that happens with leg cramps is electrolyte disturbances. This can happen after things like Lyme and mold and many of the illnesses we talk about, or just adequate, uh, maybe dehydration. So say you come to Colorado to visit uh, my state here and you aren't drinking enough water, you're in altitude and you get dehydrated. That can be one cause. Um, electrolyte disturbances due to inadequate hydration and mold illness are very common. Most all of my patients with mold related illness are on some sort of electrolytes so that that will be less common and especially potassium and magnesium are important. So if you don't find a good electrolyte, you can even just substitute a pill of potassium magnesium, and that will often help. Um, there are other issues that can cause leg cramps, but the most common is electrolyte deficiencies. So pretty easy thing to remedy. And I want to uh, mention, um, I have a wonderful workout essentials mix. Um, we did this because I wanted something that has the electrolytes, but often I have people buy electrolytes and then amino acids to keep their muscle mass and brain and neurotransmitters, and then creatine to decrease fat and increase muscle. And this is everything in one. It has the workout essentials. One of my favorite things, it has the electrolytes for a workout. It has the amino acids to keep your muscle mass and your neurotransmitters happy. And it has the creatine. So it's all in one mix and you can do a scoop of that in water every day. Even if you're not working out, it works really well. Okay. So, um, few more questions and then I'm going to have to wrap up today, but I'll be back. Um, leg cramps, we talked about mold brings down DHEA and energy. Is it okay to take DHEA from Andy? Well, of course, work with your doctor on this. I can't really give you specific medical advice, but if you're testing DHEA and it's low, it is adequate. It is appropriate to uh, take some 50 is a pretty high dose. I typically give for women 10 or 20 and for men, maybe 50, 25, 50, sometimes higher doses, but definitely work with your practitioner on the doses that high, because you want to check and make sure it's not going down and making excess estrogen. If you're at risk for cancer, because DHA is high up in the um, pathway and it can go down and make testosterone. It can make more cortisol or it can make more estrogen. And for example, if you have high cortisol and you take a lot of DHEA, you might have more cortisol, which could contribute to weight gain. Or if it goes down and makes more testosterone, you could have acne. So just be aware that there are things that it can go down different pathways and work with your doctor to check those levels and make sure your dose is appropriate. Uh, Tyler treat, treating Marcon. So gosh, I'm part of the ICI group. You guys have probably heard this. It's a nonprofit that deals with uh, mold and Lyme related biotoxin illness. You can find more information about docs at ICI.org. That's I S E A I.org. Um, tons of free resources there. And I've interviewed a lot of the board members, so you can find those on my interviews. Uh, but the question is treating Marcon. So many of us in this um, industry of treating mold related illness, used to believe that you must treat Marcon's in order to proceed and get well. Most of us have uh, found that that is not true. So while Marcon's can uh, contribute to symptoms and decreased neurotransmitters and uh, hormones in the brain and pituitary, it is important to treat, but uh, having it cleared is not essential for getting well. So if you're one of those people who's tried three months, six months, 12 months of treatment, silver, EDTA, bag spray, um, all of the things that are out there and you're not getting clear, but you're making progress, that's okay. You will be fine. Okay, um, I think I'll do it. just one more question. Angie, do you work on molding heavy metals before thyroid support or thyroid support first? Oh gosh, great question because order of operations is so important. Um, how I view this is first uh, principle of functional medicine is usually there's toxic loaded infectious burden. And I'm always trying to find which of those two things is present in my patients and then um, what order to treat that. Um, if the limbic system is activated and someone is having trauma from mold or Lyme or illness or whatever, we really have to make a, a create a safe place for that patient because safety feeling the body a safe place to heal and emotionally and psychologically is really critical. If you're in that fight or flight response, no amount of supplements or detox is going to overcome that limbic system activation. So treating the limbic system, the fight or flight response, whether it's through somatic therapies, whether it's through some of the DNRS or Gupta protocols or any of those all really critical. 
Um, you can find an article on my website on limbic activation. If you go to jillcarnian.com and just look in the blogs, um, I've been writing about that. You can just search for that there. Uh, there's lots of ways to do that. And then if you have a lot of mast cell activation where there's histamine and prostaglandins and inflammation, and you're super sensitive to everything you take, raise your hand out there. If you're dealing with that or have dealt with that, you really have to go very slow and deal with that mast cell activation as well. And then you go down the pathway for detoxification, treatment of infections, and you can start to balance the hormones like thyroid in that process. But often those things are masking, like your thyroid might look normal, but you feel hypothyroid because of the toxic load. So thyroid hormone isn't the answer, right? It's usually getting that toxic load down and then dealing with the um, infections. But you can do those simultaneously as long as you take care of the first things first. Okay. Um, Last question. I know I said that a minute ago. Uh, is cholesteramine a good binder? Um, so there are prescription binders like cholesteramine, well call, et cetera. Um, I almost always start with natural binders first. There is um, evidence that cholesteramine is particularly good for okra toxin. So if that's your number one or only toxin, those are the cases where I might start with cholesteramine. Um, thank you guys. Today was short and sweet, but fun as always. You can find this recording here or on YouTube or on iTunes. Eventually we'll have those up. Um, thanks again for joining me today and please come back. We'll be back uh, next month in October, um, which is just around the corner for more Q&A live uh, with Dr. Jill. Thank you all. And I hope you have a wonderful evening.